Uh, we are so thrilled to have you here tonight. Um, my name is Marjorie Dove Kent, and I'm the director of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. And I'm here tonight representing the Jews Against Islamophobia Coalition, which is a coalition of three organizations, uh, JFridge, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, a Jewish Voice for Peace, and Jews Say No. And we are absolutely thrilled um, to have this fantastic panel uh, of people here tonight. This is the second panel um, in a series of three that we are hosting. And so be sure to make sure that your contact information um, is down uh, at the sign-in table so we can make sure to let you know about the third panel. Um, so before we start, I want to ask everyone to put their cell phones on vibrate or and the work that we can do together to enact systemic change. Um, we're really thrilled about this series as a way to talk and listen and reflect together to make sure that our activism and our organizing is really informed and connected. Um, so, uh, like I said, we have an amazing panel here. Looks like we might have to be a little bit louder because we're competing for sound. Um, we have uh, Frank Antonio Lopez, Alan Levine, Linda, Linda Sarsour, and Manir Awad. And I will introduce each of them before they speak, but I would just like to ask to give a round of applause before we begin for these tremendous folks here. And uh, after we've heard from each of our speakers, we will have time for questions from you. So write them down, keep them in your minds, um, and make sure to keep them for the end of the program. Um, so without further ado, let's get right into it. Um, our first speaker is Munir Awad. Uh, Munir is the executive director of the New York chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations, known as CARE New York. He started working with CARE in 2010 as the executive director of the Oklahoma chapter, where Muneer was the lawyer and plaintiff that filed the landmark lawsuit to stop that state from implementing an anti-Sharia bill that was promoted to defame and demonize Muslims. Munir has created and presented workshops for private institutions, media outlets, and universities to enhance the understanding of Islam and to combat Islamophobia. He also helped develop the Muslim Youth Leadership Symposium, one of the largest programs to develop young activists and civic leaders in the American Muslim community. In 2011, he was awarded with the Tulsa Metropolitan Ministry Russell Bennett Recognition, which recognizes people who provide courageous social justice leadership. And in 2012, Munir became a fellow at the University of Southern California's American Muslim Civic Leadership Institute. Please give a round of applause for Munir Awad. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for being great hosts. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. I was excited to know that uh, we'd be here speaking about this topic, but also I thought it was a great opportunity for people to see that the work CARE New York does is not isolated. And I was, I, I am honored. I'm glad not only to be working with on a regular basis, but to be on this panel with uh, representatives from AANY, who we work with often, uh, Mr. Alan Levine, who we work with often, who's a great asset, uh, the JAI Coalition, and uh, I did get to know a lot about Frank's work before coming here. I looked it up recently, so I don't have much of a history. But we do sit in the only love seat up here, so I'm sure we're going to get very close uh, tonight. Um, but I bring that up because, you know, honestly, I, I wanted people to try and make the connections and realize the work we do is not isolated. You know, CARE New York is not working alone to defeat Islamophobia. And none of the groups that are trying to combat intolerance and Islamophobia are actually working alone. Uh, and American culture, 
politics, media, organized religion, and even education. And when we think about all the areas where Islamophobia exists today, we realize that one organization cannot combat Islamophobia in a whole in America. And, you know, that's a good thing. You know, we, we realize, we have to realize that there are different organizations doing different things and realize what our strengths are, working together to combat Islamophobia. But we also don't want one organization combating it because it would really rob America of an opportunity to defeat bigotry together, to really come together to defeat bigotry, to do it as a community, to give a mass opposition, a mass uh, voice countering bigotry, anti-Muslim bigotry, and Islamophobia in America today. Um, but what I wanted to cover in the, the presentation, or at least a very short discussion on my behalf before we get into a larger discussion, are a few things about Islamophobia to help put it in the context and understand why it takes so many organizations, why it takes a collective effort to really combat it. And first and foremost, I think it's, it's very important that we all acknowledge Islamophobia is never sincerely rooted in combating extremism or terrorism. That's just not what Islamophobia is. Many times we hear a justification of what many people in this room or on this panel will define as Islamophobia as saying, well, this is a response to Islamic extremism. And that's just not the case. And I think many times when we talk about countering Islamophobia, we need to acknowledge that and realize that attacks on the Muslim community in America have been acts of Islamophobia, acts of bigotry, and not connected to our security or our safety. So when Michelle Bachman attacks the aide of Hillary Clinton, claiming she's attacking terrorist organizations, we need to be better than that and realize that's just not the case. When Peter King claims to be countering homegrown extremism, but doing it by saying extremism is rooted in Muslim student associations across America, we need to be better than that and realize that's just not the case. When anti-Muslim hate groups claim that they are protecting America by uh, ridiculing or attacking Campbell's Soup or Butterball Turkey for providing Muslim dietary options, we need to realize that this is just not the case. This truly is a form of bigotry that has been accepted into mainstream discourse. And I think once we understand that, that you know, the next time we hear Fox News warning us about a mega mosque saying that this could be a home base for terrorism, we need to realize that this is truly Fox News and other people trying to stop a religious minority in America from building a house of worship. And that has no connection to our, our nation's security. Um, a second thing I think we need to realize about Islamophobia, and it helps us understand why it's grown so much, is that it feeds itself. So when we hear about Islamophobia and we think, you know, these are isolated incidents, we also need to be able to put it in the context and realize when we have a hostile environment or anti-Muslim sentiments in our community, maybe we should be just as concerned about the United States Army using pictures of women in a headscarf behind a Quranic verse as target practice as we are concerned about anti-Muslim violence in the streets of New York City. We need to be as concerned that law enforcement officers are going to get training about Muslims at evangelical churches as we are about anti-Muslim violence in the streets of New York City. And that does occur. So we have a number of incidents where we found that evangelical churches were hosting experts on Islam and inviting local police departments. And we have found out that many police departments were sending their officers to these churches to learn about Muslims. Uh, in particular, how Muslims are trying to infiltrate the US, establish Sharia law, and how abusive they are towards women. These are lessons that are being taught. We should be as outraged by that as we are by hate crimes that occur in our cities. And also realizing that when our politicians go to briefings or have members on their staff that are affiliated with anti-Muslim hate groups, to also be able to realize that that is connected to the hostility and the violence that American Muslims uh, are under threat of in many cities in the United States. To stop looking at incidents of hate-related violence as isolated incidents, but realizing that many times our own government policies, our own law enforcement, our own elected officials actually perpetuate the ideas that create that climate of hostility. And last, also understanding that Islamophobia 
is closely aligned with and perpetuated by the conservative right wing movement. And there has to be an acknowledgement of this in order to make sure we hold our elected officials accountable and really clean up our electoral process. So many times when we talk about some of the most um, uh, ludicrous slanders against Muslims and Islam, and we look at the source of that, we will find out that many of the groups that are also anti-Muslim happen to be anti-many other things. And many of the groups that claim Muslims are trying to impose their values on America happen to be groups who are actually trying to impose their own values on America. I think those are connections that we all have to make in order to better understand really where Islamophobia is in America today. And I'm sure other panelists will hit up on these things. But just to close on two things, understanding why this movement has been so successful, right? Uh, we don't believe that this sentiment represents the majority of America. Neither does it represent American values. Despite many of the groups or many of the politicians claiming to be patriotic, despite many of the groups attacking Muslims, uh, whether in public policy or in our communities, are doing it with names such as Americans for Family Values or whatever patriotic name they can come with. But realizing that these groups are a minority voice in America, but also understanding that they happen to have billions of dollars of funding uh, I think m many of you may be familiar with it, but in uh, a report by the Center for American Progress called Fear, Inc. Um, actually documents some of the millions, over $43 million that has been poured into anti-Muslim hate groups in the last decade by certain foundations. But also realizing these groups are very well organized and have a great presence online. They tend to overrun or be very loud in their messages. When you want to see groups attack a TV show that portrays Muslims as ordinary on the Learning Channel, you'll find a mass presence online of people outraged by Muslims being portrayed as ordinary people. Uh, when you want to see Whole Foods try and acknowledge the Muslim holiday of Ramadan and put up sales for halal foods, and you would see a mass online presence of people outraged that Whole Foods is acknowledging Muslim holiday. Or whether Best Buy tries to do a sale based on a Muslim holiday calendar instead of only the traditional one they have been using, you'll notice a mass online presence of people outraged that Best Buy is acknowledging Muslim holidays. So we do see that these tactics have worked against certain organizations. But in the end, before getting to the discussion, I think it's very important to acknowledge that the tide is starting to turn. Uh, what we're seeing, hopefully, is an exposure of how this Islamophobia network has worked in America and hopefully a realization of how to combat it. And when I mention being here with this many groups uh, and knowing that we don't only speak together on panels but we work together in the community and not just with groups ourselves but also with grassroots movements, with individuals that are really concerned about these things, we see connections that are being made in America. We see people holding elected officials accountable, shaming elected officials into having meetings with anti-Muslim hate groups. We see people holding member of the media accountable, shaming them for hosting anti-Muslim hate networks on their program. Uh, recently, we've been reaching out to CNN, who has conveniently been hosting one of the most prominent anti-Muslim bloggers, Pamela Geller, to talk about Second Amendment rights. Uh, totally outside the scope of her normal work, but almost validating her as an expert by having her on to speak about these other issues. But we see an exposure and people finally starting to speak out against this. And, you know, in particular, just to close out with some of the things CARE is working on, and hopefully we'll be able to talk about that more often, is the access to the media. Being able to present credible voices to the media, not just Muslim voices. We need to make sure when we talk about Islamophobia, it's not anti-Muslim bigots versus Muslims, but rather anti-Muslim bigots versus Americans. This is something we are working on and we constantly need assistance from other people to make sure it happens. Holding government accountable by making sure we have relationships with them. You'll see capital days across America now by various Muslim organizations and various groups in general that are making sure their constituents are heard by their elected officials to make sure that that minority we were speaking about don't dominate the discourse. And also talking about holding the promoters of this hysteria and Islamophobia accountable. Making sure that people that put up ads in our subways that are in, uh, clearly anti-Muslim and bigoted. Don't simply do it without getting away with it, 
but in fact we reach out to the MTA, we reach out to elected officials and other organizations to make sure that our elected officials, our institutions and our industries know that there's a mass voice against this type of promotion of, of hatred and bigotry in America and in our communities. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk about some other campaigns, but again, I just wanted to make sure that we were able to contextualize Islamophobia uh, and realize ultimately that this is a challenge for all of us to combat. And that's why I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this panel and I look forward to some of the great stuff that's gonna come out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Munir. Um, I want to give a moment for people who are in the back. If there's, if you're sitting next to an empty chair, if one is possible, raise your hand. Otherwise, there's there's room on the side here and on the side there, and uh, where you could sit on the carpet and have a place to lean back on. So I encourage everybody to 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 come and do that now. Um, so thank you. I I loved the connection there of. Um, these are not isolated incidents and we can't counter them in isolation. Um, I thought that was, that was beautiful. So, um, our next uh, fabulous speaker is Frank Antonio Lopez, uh, who is a hip hop artist, educator, and film, filmmaker. He is also a member of the internationally recognized hip hop spoken word crew, The Peace Poets. Frank is currently working as an organizer with the Brotherhood Sister Soul, a community organization that provides holistic services for black and Latino youth in West Harlem and with the Game Changers Project, creating films around the topic of fair policing. So please give a warm welcome to Frank. Thank you. Peace family, it's really good to be here with you all. Um, it's really good to be on this panel with such amazing people that I truly do admire for the work that they do and the human beings that they are. Um, I really like the idea of the fact that the work that we do is not isolated. Um, we don't do it alone and that gives me so much hope. Um, I thought a lot about what I would present to you all um, coming from the Brotherhood Sister Soul Rights of Passage organization in West Harlem that works predominantly with black and Latino youth. Um, from the ages of 8 to 22, um, doing rites of passage work, uh, after school programming, international study programs for the young people in Harlem. And what I could present to you all, the, the most valuable thing, would be the voice and story of uh, my brothers and sisters and what we're dealing with around, specifically with uh, the policy around stop, question, and frisk. Um, before anything, I would want to present to you um, something that I, the only, one of the best ways that I know how to communicate, and it is through uh, poetry. Um, I wrote this specifically um, for an event around the Sean Bell 50 Shots 50 Artists, um, when Mahina Movement, a well-known group here in the city, put together a poetry um, and artist collective uh, for, in honor of Sean Bell. What is the price of life and who pays the cost? When 50 odd shots try to raise a corpse, when the body laid out with somebody to someone, a son, father, brother, or a lover to someone, a man in his prime or the dream to become one, a land where the time doesn't seem to give them some, we move from a matters and then back to the humdrum, while cops get away, they get paid in a lump sum. We move in indifference, the mood is indifferent, cops say move and we move in an instance, move in assistance to crime in our midst, man I'm tired of the lies that be fueling their pistons. We ride for the pride of a people's community. Cause whose streets? Our streets. Whose streets? Our streets. Whose streets? Our streets. We keep in the unity. And even though what they do might be nothing new to us, it's realizing that what they do to them is exactly what they do to us. At the Brothers and Sisters Soul, we have um, 10 focus issues that we implement into all programming, into all of our curriculum, um, including sexism, misogyny, um, including political education and social justice. And this goes into all of the work that we do from the youngest amongst us um, to the oldest and to the alumni. Um, and that, what that creates is a, a movement of young people that have knowledge of self, that have knowledge of their community, 
and knowledge of the world. So like I said, the international programs, um, the international study programs that take us to South Africa, Brazil, Dominican Republic, and now Haiti, create uh, education for them to know their world and to know what's going on, but also to know the movements around the world and who, who have been um, at the forefront of those movements. And so I've been blessed to have been partaken in that since I was 16 years old um, as an after school counselor, as a summer day camp counselor, um, as a creative writing teacher, and now as a community organizing working with the Brothers and Sisters Soul. One of our programs, the Liberation Program, um, is specific to uh, young activists. And right now we have the honor actually of a young man, Nicholas Pert, who is in the corner over there. Uh, Nick, if you could raise your hand, just want to shout you out. Um, Uh, he was a young man who wrote the op-ed piece in the New York Times around uh, why is the NYPD after me. Um, and so I have a lot of respect for my peers, for my comrades, um, and for the mentors who have come before us and have passed the mic and have passed the torch to us. And I, I feel like that speaks to the work that the Brothers and Sisters Soul does, but also to the young people that are coming up in the community speaking around these issues. Um, and we always say that young people are some of the groups that are spoken the most about, but don't um, speak up the most, right? Don't, don't get a chance to speak up the most. So thank you um, for having me on this panel um, and for being able to offer these stories. I want to just read a part of what Nicholas wrote in the op-ed piece that I feel speaks to the idea of rite of passage and the, the story that young, young people in our community go through. For young people in my neighborhood, getting stopped and frisked is a rite of passage. We expect the police to jump us at any moment. We know the rules, don't run, and don't try to explain. Because speaking up for yourself might get you arrested or worse. And we all feel the same way. Degraded, harassed, violated, and criminalized because we're black or Latino. Have I been stopped more than the average young black person? I don't know. But I look like a zillion other people on the street, and we're all just trying to live our lives. Um, since then, Nick has, since Nick writing that article, he's spoken up at uh, CNN, WBAI, Democracy Now!, and is also part of the Floyd versus New York City case around racial profiling as, as submitted his testimony. And that, I feel, is something that um, we could, is one of the most powerful things that we could share is simply our story and being in community with others who have experienced similar um, incidents. But deeper behind this idea of statistics and young black and Latino men being some of the highest um, demographic that is stopped and frisked, um, questioned or inconvenienced, as Commissioner Kelly would say, what I think of, especially as an educator, um, I regard myself deeply as doing the, the work that I do with the brothers and sisters, so as a healer as well, I think about the trauma that then that invites into our communities. Um, substandard education is violent, um, substandard housing is violent. And then to have to navigate around um, incidents with the people that you feel are supposed to protect you is also a deep sense of violence and causes a deep, deep-seated trauma in our young people. And we know that, we know that now that I have the privilege of giving workshops around this education, bringing it back and disseminating all this information that I gather back to our organization and implementing it into our education. Um, we know that the young people are dealing with this, and it becomes so normal. It becomes to be such a rite of passage for them that it's scary how normalized they, that could turn into. It's scary how, how often young people deal with this, but then don't know that to speak up, or don't know that this is something that shouldn't be happening. And so the criminalization of a community is something that we deal with every day. And I have the privilege um, to sit here on this panel and speak, and. Um, work with you all in, in uh, navigating this, navigating the criminalization of communities, um, not just in the black and Latino community, um, but also in the, in the Muslim Arab um, communities as well. Um, one thing I would leave you with is the idea of creating a city that is not just reactive, but is proactive, and I feel that that's a lot of the work that, that we do is uh, Brotherhood Sister So is not an external reactive response to what is wrong with our communities, but a proactive initiative designed to address the community needs by the community itself. Um, 
and I hope to, to keep this work going. I hope to keep learning and to keep being surrounded by powerhouses um, like you all. And thank you for this opportunity. Peace. Thank you so much. So I think that Frank brought up a really uh, important piece of that, which is the healing work that is actually a part of the activism we do, and that doing this work together in coalition, that doing this work out on the streets is actually about healing some very deep violence that's, that's taking place for communities. Um, and also, thank you for bringing in the power that um, our art and our creativity and our freedom has um, in, in this work and um, encouraging all of us, I think, to, to be our, our creative selves in this. So thank you. Um, so we have another great problem of, of more people that need room. So once again, there is, there is room up here. There is room on the side, not in chairs, but on the floor. Um, please don't be shy. Come in and, and find a place that's comfortable for you so you don't have to stay standing. Um, okay. Ah, yes, there are also seats under Jenny. <laughs> okay. Um, our third speaker that we are so honored to have here tonight is Alan Levine. Alan is a civil rights and constitutional lawyer whose work has ranged from protection um, of protesters to the defense of immigrant workers. He has taught constitutional law and is the author of The Rights of Students. He represented Demi, Debbie Almentasser, the principal of the Khalil Gibran International Academy, the first Arabic language, dual language public school. Yeah, is Debbie here, actually? Let's give her a round of applause. Great. Oh, there she is. All right, let's give Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Um, uh, yes, um, for the, the first Arabic language dual language program school in her suit against the city and Department of Education. And Alan is the author of Unconstitutional Surveillance about the NYPD's surveillance of the Muslim community. He is currently special counsel to Latino Justice PRLDEF. He is also a founding member of the Jews Against Islamophobia Coalition and Jews Say No and contributes to the, yes. And contribute to the Beyond the Pale radio show on WBAI. Um, and we are so honored to have him speak tonight. So thank you, Alan. Thank you so much, Marjorie. Uh, thank you all for being here. What a great pleasure to be amongst a group of such great activists. And is this off? Is it, oh, it just wasn't close enough, I'm sorry. Anyhow, I was just talking about what a great pleasure to be with such a group of activists and for the first time in my many panel appearances to be on a panel with a hip hop artist. Frank, a great pleasure. Um, as Manir said, none of these acts of Islamophobia about which he spoke should be considered in isolation, and though my topic is NYPD surveillance of the Muslim community, it's of a piece with, with larger movements of Islamophobia in New York, to which both certified bigots contribute, but also community and po political leaders contribute, either by their endorsement of things like the NYPD surveillance uh, or by their silence. What has the NYPD done with regard to the Muslim community? Starting about 10 years ago, uh, soon after 9-11, um, they began a program, created a unit called the Demographics Unit. And the Demographics Unit uh, placed informers throughout the Muslim community. Uh, they uh, they hung out in bookstores and in cafes and in businesses. Uh, they attended um, uh, houses of worship. And they took notes and recorded whatever they thought sounded suspicious. Um, they called these police informants who visited these establishments rakers. 
people who raked in information, and the people uh, who attended the informants who intended mosques, they called mosque crawlers, uh, terms which suggest the the contempt which underlay this this program. Um, they planted surveillance cameras outside of mosques and recorded who went in and out of the mosques. Um, they examined records of a Muslim elementary school and they had an NYPD informant accompanying Muslim college students on a rafting trip. Why? According to Commissioner Kelly, New York is where they've come before and where we believe they want to come again, to hit us again and kill us. He was referring to 9-11. He didn't explicitly say why his concern for 9-11 warranted having people in mosques or on rafting trips or looking at elementary school records. But some of the defenders of the police department say, well, those are places where sometimes terrorists hang out. Uh, one of its defenders said that there was a plot that was uncovered because um, uh, someone was overheard in a park in New York City. And um, one of the plotters was overheard uh, talking to somebody on a hike at Bear Mountain. Well, there's nothing wrong, of course, with the police following up criminal leads and investigations. And if one of those leads brings them to a park or to Bear Mountain, that's okay. What they can't do is go to those places because Muslims go there. That's the fatal flaw. Now, the commissioner said, well, we do this because we've stopped 14 terrorist attacks, the mayor said. We've stopped 14 attacks since 9-11, fortunately without anybody dying. Now, at the time I wrote my piece, uh, a ProPublica reporter had exam examined those 14 alleged uh, plots and found that they were pretty flimsy stuff indeed, and to the extent they existed, either the NYPD or the FBI had actually instigated those plots, or they had nothing to do with stopping them. But it turns out only uh, a couple of months after I wrote in August of last year, the lawyers in the Hanshu case, about which you'll hear more in a moment, uh, took a deposition of Thomas Galati. Thomas Galati ran the demographics unit, was a high up in the intelligence division, and he had been head of the demographics unit since 2006, and he said not a single lead had been generated by the work of the demographics unit since 2006, and he couldn't think of any before. The Hanshu Guidelines. Hanshu versus City of New York was a case instigated back in the 70s um, by uh, political lawyers and political activists to challenge work of the NYPD, that work being intense surveillance of political activists. It was work that had continued the McCarthy era work of the so-called Red Squad which tracked activists and dissenters around the city, kept files on them, and then uh, uh, conducted what they thought would be appropriate surveillance. And in the, in, in the 60s and 70s, they continued that work, and uh, a lawsuit was brought. Uh, a great deal of evidence was adduced about what the police were doing, and a... Um, uh, eventually, the NYPD and the lawyers for the plaintiffs entered into a settlement, and that settlement said that the police could not investigate political and religious organizations and groups 
unless there was, quote, specific information that the group was linked to a crime that had been committed or was about to be committed. In recent months, or in recent years actually, since 9-11, the guidelines have been amended to give the police greater uh, investigative uh, and surveillance powers, but with a very specific limitation. They were allowed to go to public places where they thought there might be political activity. Uh, I'm sorry, where they thought there might be criminal activity. And even if there was political activity, they were permitted to go there if there was some basis for suspecting there was criminal activity. However, in the absence of criminal activity, they were prohibited from recording anything that they observed, thus eliminating uh, the historic problem that was created by uh, the, the, the activities that Hanshu was addressed to. Nevertheless, the uh, NYPD has continued to say that the Hanshu guidelines uh, permit the surveillance of the Muslim American community. Uh, there are a couple of Hanshu lawyers in, in the room with us and at some point, uh, if, if people want, they can speak to that. Let me just say, to suggest how illegitimate this program is and how little it bears any relationship to any legitimate law enforcement program. Never, never in the history of this country in peacetime has the NYPD or any other law enforcement program to anybody's knowledge, certainly never admitted to conducting investigations or law enforcement activities against a racial, ethnic, or religious group. Never. The one exception I said peacetime was during World War II when the, uh, there were, as you well know, widespread intern internships interning of imprisonment of uh, Japanese Americans. And when that was challenged in court, though it was upheld by the Supreme Court, the dissenting judge said, and his words have become uh, the, the shared wisdom uh, of the Japanese internships, internships, he said, this program brings us to the ugly abyss of racism. And that's what the NYPD surveillance program does. And the defense of that program by the mayor and by the chief police, chief of police, is what gives force to the bigots like Pamela Geller. Pamela Geller would just be a loudmouthed bigot putting up hateful ads in the subways, perhaps engaged in the harmless exercise of First Amendment rights, but she is saying things about Muslims, about a group that the NYPD has said is worthy of suspicion, that the NYPD associates with terrorism. The defenders of the program say it is just a harmless program without much injury. Uh, the injury to the Muslim community is incalculable, both in terms of the harm, the humiliation that it suffers, the suppression of its ability to speak out, but also in the encouragement that it gives to those who would be suspicious of and prejudiced against the Muslim community. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Um, I think that's actually an important phrase that we could use in our organizing, that we're, again, at the ugly abyss of racism. Uh, I think that uh, many in this room would agree that we are at that point again, and uh, that it's the job of, of all of us to bring us back from that cliff. Um, so that, I, I can think of no better intro for, for bringing us back uh, than to then introduce Linda Sarsour. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Linda Sarsour is a working woman, community activist, and mother of three. 
ambitious, outspoken, and independent for sure. Linda shatters stereotypes of Muslim women while also treasuring her religious and ethnic heritage. She is a Palestinian Muslim American and a self-proclaimed pure New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn. Currently, she is the National Advocacy Director for the National Network for Arab American Communities and locally serving as the Director of the Arab American Association of New York, a social service agency serving the Arab community in New York City. Linda has been at the forefront of public debate on the NYPD's blanket surveillance of the Muslim community. She has been featured in local, national, and international media. Linda's strengths are in the areas of community development, youth empowerment, community organizing, civic engagement, and immigrants' rights advocacy. Please, a huge round of applause for Linda Sarsour. How's everybody doing tonight? <laughs> so I'm kind of like emotional tonight. Like, I don't know why. Like, so excuse me um, uh, if I get a little emotional tonight. Um, you know, sometimes when we come on the stage, we come because we're some sort of like expert on something or we represent an organization or a particular constituency or we have a community that we work with that's experiencing, experiencing something. So we come to share that. Um, and three weeks ago, um, I, I came to the realization that the work that I'm doing is a lot more personal for me than it is just about a community that I work with or a community that I come from. Um, three weeks ago, my son um, went to, was invited to a high school interview at Millennium High School in Brooklyn. And one of the requirements was you needed to bring with you a most recent graded paper from your language arts class. So I told my son, you know, go to school, make sure you, your English teacher gives you a paper. Um, so we could take it to the appointment. It was on a Saturday. So this was like Friday. You know, my son's one of those kids that like waits for the last, waits for the last minute. So it was like Friday. And I'm like, hey, did you get your letter, uh, your graded paper? He's like, yeah, mom, don't worry, I got it. So the next morning, we're on the way to the appointment. I'm like trying to organize my son's paperwork. Um, and, you know, I start reading this letter, this, uh, this essay that he wrote. Um, that I wanted to share with you, and I actually shared on my blog, um, obviously with the permission of my son, but to realize the type of trauma that our young people are going through, whether you're a child that's afraid of being stopped and frisked, or whether you are a child that's experiencing this kind of environment around you of Islamophobia. Um, my son's a sports fanatic, so everything for him is he tries to create analogies with sports, um, and he wrote this essay that said that he, uh, he says, my life is like a NASCAR race. My life's engine shuts down but I have to go into the pit to fix it. A tire goes flat and you go to the pit to fix it. After all that, I always go to the right way. And he goes on to say that sometimes one of my tires goes flat. And one time in the fourth grade, I got a very challenging question right. And one kid says to me, of course the Muslim got it right. He's gonna use the equation to create a bomb. When he said that, it really hurt my feelings. I ignored it. And for me, that was like going to the pit stop. Sometimes my culture is portrayed as the evil culture, but we are probably the most down-to-earth people anybody would know. One way people have put me down is only knowing that my people as the terrorist. A second way is that they won't let us speak upon our own behalf. And my last reason is because my experiences show me that people are ignorant. We're talking about a kid that's in eighth grade. A regular kid, he could be in a class with your child or with your grandchild. And the fact that a child has to sit and ponder with these types of questions is what really hurts me the most and is really um, what provides the motivation around the work that we're doing. And I know that's the same for many of the folks who are organizing with young people around Stop and Frisk. And these, these documents, uh, this essay has or this been in my bags for three weeks and I'm probably gonna try to hold it with me as long as I can keep these papers um, intact. Um, so I wanted to, to kind of connect for, you, for myself how important and personal um, this issue of combating Islamophobia and, and racism, but more specifically institutionalized racism and how it affects the future generations of the people that are taking over um, for us and particularly those that will be working in these movements. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna provide opportunities for hope because in order for me to continue to do this work, I need to see hope. I need something that provides that light at the end of the tunnel. And that light and hope exists 
um, in this world. So a lot of people here uh, on the panel talked about the subway ads. You know, people are like First Amendment, you know, people can put up whether, whatever they want. But just to give you uh, just an example of the type of people, wonderful, amazing people out there in this world. Is, is Akiva in the room? Akiva? Akiva's back there. He's like, why is this lady calling out my name in the home? Today is the first time I ever met Akiva in person. I haven't actually met him, but I met him from here. I saw uh, in Diego campaign online. Uh, it was called Talk Back to Hate. I never met Akiva. I don't know who he is. I don't even. I, I had no idea who this guy was. I didn't even know he, there was a guy named Akiva that was even co connected to this campaign. I saw the campaign. I looked at. I looked at what they were doing. They wanted to raise seventy-five hundred dollars. I was like, I'm on that. I don't care who it is that's behind that. It's someone that I want to work with, it's someone I want to know, and it's someone that I want to be a be friends with in New York City. Akiva is, he, he uh, describes himself as a 30-year-old white guy who lives in Manhattan. He's a grandchild of Holocaust survivors who came to the United States for freedom, tolerance, and prosperity. That's the kind of New Yorker that I want to work with, and that's the kind of New Yorker that provides the hope that I have in our city to combat people like Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer and all those bigots, including the elected officials who are aligned on that type of messaging. There's also another ad campaign that's going up on February 8th called Citizens Against Tate. And when you see these ads up, you will recognize some familiar faces, including my colleague Faiza Ali's beautiful face will be on that on that uh, ad. And the ad is basically uh, an ad that shows Muslim Americans and others and our and our and people that like for example in that one picture that you'll see, you have a Latina, Mexican American, Evelyn Garcia, who's a organizer in my organization, Tina, she's African American, Faiza, who is Muslim American, and Sophie, who's actually a young woman who's been interning with us for a year from France. Um, you see this beautiful array of young, beautiful women who were doing Sandy relief, who 48 hours after Sandy, we were the first, one of the first groups that was out in Staten Island providing whatever services we can do on the ground. And that's our uh, ad campaign to combat, to show that regardless of where you come from and who you are, um, that people came together to, to provide service. Um, so you'll see those in, uh, I believe, 10 uh, subway or 25 subway stations um, in New York City starting on February 8th. A couple of areas, I think when people leave it, when I go to a panel, one thing that I want to leave with is like, all right, you know, this sounds all, you know, really bad and we really need to work together, I got that. But what exactly is it that you want me to do? Like, where is it, what's my role in all of the things that you're talking about? And I think there's so much opportunity for all of you to be involved in something that makes sense to you. Uh, Frank um, is part, uh, Frank also and myself, uh, the Arab American Association of New York and many others in the room were part uh, or, uh, supporting organizations, including um, Jay Fredge, of Communities United for Police Reform. It's a citywide um, uh, coalition of different groups uh, working to make the NYPD accountable to our communities and to our taxpayer dollars. Um, and there's some opportunities coming up really soon that we need you, uh, we need you there. And I just pictured this by looking out at this audience. You don't have the view that I have. March 11th is the start of the Floyd uh, trial um, that Frank talked about. And we, wanna, we want the judge, we want the prosecutors, and we want the city of New York to understand one thing. That we will not allow them to go into a trial without seeing the movement in the trial, this is not taking a couple of defendants. These, these are defendants that are, these are plaintiffs, I'm sorry, that are putting their name out. It's not for them. They're doing this for the movement. They're doing this for their communities and they're doing this for the future of our city. And it is up to us to pack those courthouses. So starting on March 11th, and we will be working with Jews against Islamophobia, and we will have a day where we will pack the courthouse. We'll be standing in the back. And we want them to know that all of us in this room are here and we want to stop the discriminatory policies and the criminalization of our communities by the New York Police Department. So watch out for that. We also um, have social media opportunities. Every Tuesday and Thursdays um, at two to three o'clock, join us on Twitter, hashtag change the NYPD. Join our conversations, tweet, Tell the world your story. Right now, we have this major opportunity 
in 2013 to tell our own stories. I don't need CNN to tell my story. I don't know, half the people I hang out with don't even read CNN online or even watch CNN or even have cable to watch CNN. So we need to start creating our own stories and telling our own stories. Um, so Twitter, definitely get on that. Um, and following our organizations online um, is going to be your way to stay connected to what's going on. So if you're on Facebook, uh, it'd be great for you to uh, like the Muslim American Civil Liberties Coalition, which um, both uh, Munir uh, here in New York and my organization are a part of. It's a, city, it's a citywide coalition of Muslim American organizations and civil rights groups um, protecting and the civil rights of Muslim communities through different uh, strategies. Um, but to, to end on the note um, around just some of the NYPD accountability messaging, and I think something that's really important here is that for me, whether you're spying on the entire Muslim community or stopping and frisking every black and Latino young person in the city, it's all the same thing. It's a discriminatory, institutionalized racism of a New York police department that has basically subjected our, basically are saying that our entire communities are suspect of terrorism, and if you're black or Latino, you, d you must be some sort of criminal. At some point, you will be, so we're just gonna stop you before you become one, right? So I think that the talking points and the great coalition work that has happened is just by saying, you know what? Let's stop separating the issues. Let's stop NYPD's discriminatory policies of our communities. Um, and when we talk, when, when I'm talking about NYPD surveillance, I'm talking about stop and frisk, and when folks are talking about stop and frisk, they're talking about Muslim communities, because at the end of the day, we're gonna win this together. And blacks and Latinos are not gonna win this together, and the Muslims are not gonna win this. I mean, the blacks and Latinos are not gonna win this alone, and the Muslims doing it alone are not gonna win. We're gonna only do this together. And I will leave this on one point. A lot of people don't believe in this particular track I do. We have a mayoral election coming up. There is a primary and there's a general election. And the way that I do democracy is I don't vote party, I vote issue, I vote, for the candidates that stand up for my issues, the candidates that are right on the issues. So what I'm asking for you from now until the primaries and then the general election, which I'm actually more concerned with the primaries right now, is that people make sure that you vote, register your friends to vote, and make sure when you go to the polls, you're taking your friends and you're telling them you're voting for the candidate that stands up for police reform, that stands up for the civil rights of all New Yorkers and the, those that represent our communities and show us the dignity and respect that we deserve. Thank you, Linda. So just a little bit of information on that, what Linda just spoke to. Um, one of the, there's, uh, there's a bunch of ways right now that communities are coming together to, to push the issue of discriminatory policing by the NYPD. She mentioned there's um, something called the Community Safety Act, which is a package of four bills that's before the city council now that speak to both uh, the stop and frisk practices of the NYPD and Muslim surveillance. It's really a tribute to the work that all these communities and organizations have done coming together to create legis a legislative package for our city that is speaking to the uh, uh, deep violent offenses done to communities across the line. And so that's their, their so there's the, that's the legislative strategy. And there's also the, uh, the court strategy that you saw mentioned. There's the Floyd case. There are two other cases that this kind of package of three cases that trying to push through the courts to have uh, you know, for that to be another avenue that we can use to demonstrate how not only is this not constitutional, it's it's not ethical, it's not moral, it's not the city that that we believe we should be living in. Um, and then, you know, I think that Frank referenced some of the pieces of Cop Watch um, and the alternative policing work that's happening and other ways kind of outside of these very formal systems that we are able to be active, that we're able to come together and that we're able to do real work that's about changing the NYPD street to street to street and neighborhood to neighborhood. And I think part of this that, that Frank also um, has connected us to is the art and creative work and poetry and music that we need to sustain us and to inspire us and to make this work possible for the long haul. So there's so many ways um, for you to get involved. I want to speak you know, quickly that um, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice does have a campaign right now against discriminatory policing that is part of the um, umbrella campaign against uh, 
campaign for police reform. Um, and so if you want to get involved in that, um, please make, you know, come up and talk to me. Star your name when you walk out the door on that sheet. Um, connect with someone from JFridge here tonight or uh, email us at info at jfridge.org and, and tell us you want to get involved. Why don't you go ahead, Alan? The, the Floyd trial, the stop and frisk trial, which Linda says is starting March 11, is down at the United States Courthouse, which is down near Foley Square. It's 500 Pearl Street. Um, it's the Brooklyn Bridge stop on the east side, Chambers Street on the west side. Really would be good to have lots of people turn out for that. And as Linda mentioned, woo, um, uh, the uh, Jews Against Islamophobia Coalition um, and um, the Arab American Association are going to be talking about having some kind of specific days that we anchor. So we're going to need people there day after day, week after week, but there's going to be some specific moments that we're anchoring that we would love um, to inform you about and keep you up to date on. Um, so please stay engaged. So um, our panel has done an amazing job of keeping to time, which means we have a really robust question and answer session available. So first of all, let's just give one more round of applause for these fabulous people. And um, we're going to start to do um, some question and answers. So I just wanted to ask from, I guess, a personal experience standpoint, how, how much crossover um, is there in your work between the black and Latino communities and Muslim and Arab American communities? And how do you envision that um, becoming more solidified in the future? Great, thank you. Uh, another question. All Israelis came from Isaac. Why all this dispute between each other? <laughs> humanity. One humanity. We have to respect each other and everyone has the right to be whatever he is. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> one more question for this round. Linda mentioned the, uh, the mayoral election, and uh, I was wondering if, if, if a question for any of the panelists to sort of about uh, any of uh, the candidates that you're looking at, what their positions are, what positions of uh, you know Christine Quinn is and uh, Bill de Blasio and so on. I think it's important to sort of... Interesting to see what you guys say about that. So on the first question around black, Latino, Muslim kind of relations, I think it's always really important to remember that a third of the uh, Muslim American community in New York City is African American, right? So within our own community, the diversity amongst Muslims and young people in places like Harlem and Central Brooklyn, uh, people forget that a large portion of our community is African American and are also dealing with stop and frisk and other issues. Um, uh, but I think on a general level, like, for example, we're in South Brooklyn, Southwest Brooklyn. So that's like Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, Bensonhurst. Not a lot of black people in our neighborhood, to tell you the truth. Um, and I think one of the ways that we've been able to build relationships uh, outside of our neighborhood is through working uh, with coalitions like Communities United for Police Reform. Um, and also uh, through our youth, right, who go to public high schools where their friends are Latino and black and figuring out how to get our young people to bring their friends into our organizations to build this inclusive environment. Um, and also uh, working with our kids around identity issues. I mean, my skin's white, but I don't, it doesn't come with the privilege that other white people have, right? So getting our kids to understand that right now we are people of color in this country, um, in our city, um, and we need to realize that and, and build our relationships with other uh, communities of color. Um, so I think that a, it's a work in progress, um, even within the Muslim community, it's a work in progress. And I think that uh, what I could thank the NYPD for is bringing and uniting our community around this issue of uh, discriminatory pot. So thank you, Commissioner Kelly, for that. Um, mayoral election. So I'm on 501c3 times. So this is going to be interesting. Just basically, basically on NYPD surveillance, um, no one's really that good. So no mayoral candidate right now is really that good, except for statements that have been made by uh, New York City Comptroller John Liu, right, who's also running for mayor. But really, people don't want to touch the Muslim surveillance piece. They've been talking about stop and frisk. I've been hearing it across the campaigns. But our issue is not at the forefront. And um, 
you know, and I think it is up to us as a community um, and for our allies to help us elevate our issue that if you're going to say stop and frisk is bad, then you have to say Muslim surveillance is bad. So I'm looking for my allies to, to have my back on this one. And I'm willing to keep pushing myself and hopefully members of our community. But I think that there needs to be more uh, creating a political environment for elected officials to say, hold up, sp spying on Muslims and stopping and frisking black and Latinos is both wrongs. We haven't gotten there yet, but I'm, 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 I'm looking for some love if you all want to help me out with that. Um, with, with regard to the candidates, it's actually worse. Uh, Quinn and de Blasio have explicitly endorsed surveillance of the Muslim community. Uh, and John Liu has said something helpful in passing, but has not taken an explicit uh, position. Um, when I said before, nothing like Muslim surveillance has ever happened before in this country, that is, no law enforcement agency has ever explicitly acknowledged going after a single racial, ethnic, or religious group. That's technically true. But, in every respect, the Muslim surveillance program is just like the stop and frisk program. The cops don't say we're going after, we don't have disproportionate numbers of stops and frisks in communities of color because they're black, because they're uh, Latino. They say that's where crime is. But that's really what they're saying about the Muslim surveillance program. There was terrorism there, that's why we're surveilling the Muslim community. There is, uh, there is more crime in communities of color. That's why we're engaged in stop and frisk. In both respects, it is deeply flawed and racist and bigoted and nothing but. Um, I think in terms of the, the question around um, the unification of, of these different communities, black Latino communities, Muslim communities, um, it would I would go straight to the source of our young people and the education that is going on right now, right this instance in this room. Um, we have the privilege of having some young people from the Brownstone, from the Brothers and Sisters So here with us today. So whatever they're hearing right now from the panelists or even from the conversation here in the Q&A, um, they're taking with them wherever they go. And um, that gives me a lot of hope that the conversation goes beyond um, beyond right here, beyond even a coalition, knowing that it's spreading around and going into schools, high schools, um, even relationships with their peers. So that's that's something that um, that's something that uh, I think will carry that that uh, coalition that conversation um, further. And just to chime in, we get to choose which questions we want to answer. Is that how it is? All right. So for the first one on the unity, I, I'm I'm very proud to work with the civil rights organization. And we actually draw upon our history and being part of a larger civil rights tradition in American history. Uh, not necessarily a Muslim tradition per se, but is in fact an American tradition. Uh, and the civil rights legacy in America is intertwined with the struggle of African Americans uh, throughout this nation's history. Um, and a very quick plug for an event, Care New York will be co-sponsoring on February 21st at the Malcolm X Center in Harlem. We will be having Professor Tariq Ramadan to talk about the transformations of Malcolm X along with other speakers. Um, and if you come to the CARE New York office, you'll see that the CARE New York office is influenced by civil rights uh, leaders such as Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. Uh, we're very honored and we're proud to have two of our legal interns, one to be an African American who happens to be Christian, and one to be a Latina who's studying at Columbia. And we realize that the, the advocacy that we're a part of really uh, attracts people across the spectrum where we make sure, as we mentioned earlier, about combating Islamophobia, not to be Muslims against anti-Muslim bigots, but in fact, the American community against anti-Muslim bigots. And we found that there's a tradition there that really draws us together. Hopefully that history uh, is what brings these minority communities together. Um, and the, you know, we have a lot to learn from that history. I'm actually very proud. Of, I'm new to New York. I've been here for six months. But my three professional mentors happen to be African Americans from Brooklyn. I don't know if that's just a coincidence, but Brooklyn has a lot to be proud of. Um, and then I want to quickly tackle comment number two. I'll take that one on. <laughs> um, comment number two is exactly right. 
But I think the perception is the problem. A lot of people believe that there's this mass voice, this this great voice against minority communities. There's this mass acceptance of stigmatizing, and marginalizing African Americans or American Muslims. But just picking on the most recent example to be quick, but there's many we can pull from. When we talk about those anti-Muslim subway ads, we notice that there was one group that was promoting this message of hatred. And thank God, I, if you guys have noticed, uh, Linda noted a couple of the campaigns, but there have been multiple campaigns, almost hard to keep account of now, of how many organizations, grassroots efforts, have been out there to promote this message of unity, to promote a message of New York, to promote a message of pride and diversity. Um, and I'm honored to be part of a coalition now that's working on trying to make sure that uh, these anti-Muslim hate ads don't become more common in the future. And that coalition is full of diverse people representing all aspects of New York that have come together. So the message is right, um, and it's, it's, it's growing with respect to practice. Hopefully we'll see that. And here we see the diversity, and I think we'll, we'll see more in the future. As long as we continue to strive for justice, we continue to strive for peace, we'll recognize that the people that are striving for us are a greater reflection of America. Thank you. Um, I also just want to actually add to that that um, another really strong part of this citywide coalition um, are LGBTQ folks and organizations um, representing lesbian, gay, um, bisexual, queer, and trans folks um, here in New York. And that that's also really exciting to see that the alliances that are being forged um, organization to organization and movement to movement are not um, just uh, along you know two or three axes of diversity, but actually all. Um, um, and there's really exciting work happening um, that, you know, where we, we kind of are forging, um, you know, I, I think something about all these groups coming together is people talk about in organizing, you know, finding the unlikely ally. And I think what's exciting is that all of the unlikely allies are together, um, which is really great, a great moment. Um, and I think something that, that we're already seeing, you know, uh, we're able to capitalize on. Um, so more questions. Yes, next round. Controversy for concerns about the Inspector General bill, some of the major benefits, and then I also we do some support work for police reform organizing project, and then some other groups are not supporting it because the, because of the mayoral appointee. So tell me why the benefits outweigh the, dis the negatives, the, the disadvantages, and what the big how the Inspector General bill will address surveillance because that's the big issue that we you know. What, the, what you feel about the concern about the mayoral appointment? Great, great, great. So specifics about the Inspector General and the mayoral appointment piece of that. Um, next question, hands that were up. Yes. Do you think that the polling that was done in New York City where there were over 60% of New Yorkers uh, supported uh, basically to legal surveillance at this moment, do you think that's why the uh, elected officials shy away? They've seen the polls in New York be so high and support of that the NYPD, and that's why they're shying away and just don't want to test the doctor. Okay, so do you think that it's because of polls that our representatives are responding to polls rather than kind of this grassroots movement of action and in their stances on uh, Muslim surveillance? Yes? Um, it's not just the mayor race. I'm wondering uh, what, what candidates for other offices uh, we need to, to look at and support. <coughs> Great, so if there's any insight on candidates for any offices um, in relation to their stances on stop and frisk or some surveillance. Basically, the ex Inspector General bill is exactly what it sounds like. It's about appointing a Inspector General to oversee the New York Police Department. Currently, the NYPD, the largest police department in the entire country, the fifth largest army in the world if it were an army, um, does not have independent oversight. The CIA has independent oversight, the FBI, every other large government entity does, ex even the New York City Parks and Recreations Department, except the New York Police Department. They have multiple mechanisms that they say provides oversight, like the Department of Investigations, like Internal Affairs, and all this other stuff, but everything is like the NYPD is still the boss of everything. And actually, in recent history, the DOI has never investigated the New York Police Department. So the controversy that Maureen is, uh, is alluding to about the Inspector General bill is how do we appoint this Inspector General if this bill were to pass? In the current bill, it says that the mayor has to appoint the Inspector General. Do you think I like that? 
I do not like that. Do you think I want Mayor Bloomberg to appoint, appoint an inspector general? Absolutely not. The reason why the mayor in this case has to is because it's in the city charter. It is illegal for us to say that someone else is going to appoint them because what we would have to do is create a public referendum and we have to change the state charter to change the city charter and all this other legal stuff that I don't understand that I'm making believe I sound like really intelligent right now only because I've been in these meetings. So one of the ways that we try to, you know, figure it out and make some people happy and we're not going to make everybody happy is by saying that the inspector general would have a seven year term. And the reason why seven years is because they would overlap with another administration, right? Because, you know, the mayoral, uh, you know, four years, four years. So they would overlap with another, another administration. So somebody has to inherit them, et cetera. Um, and the other piece um, around the inspector general uh, is how would the inspector general get to the investigations, like wh how does that process happen? So whether the city council recommends, whether they do it, how do they get into the inter into the intelligence division, you know, which is all top secret national security? Like, there's a lot of things in there, but we think that in the meantime, um, we need to have an inspector general, even if that means it's a guy and a couple of folks that work with him who are at least able to put out public reports, look into the systematic policies and practice of the New York Police Department. Um, so it's part of the legislative package. We're pushing Community Safety Act together. And again, it's not an ideal legislation, but it's what it's it's basically as good as it gets when it comes to working within the current charter um, that we have. Um, and then I'm just going to go to the other question about other candidates. First, this year is a big year, 2013. There are over 20 open city council seats in the city, across the city. There is also the comptroller race, there's a public advocate race, um, the mayoral race, obviously. So what I'm asking for people to do now as campaigns are going from community to community to garner support um, is to elevate the issues, put them on the spot, go to town hall meetings and ask questions about where do people stand on police reform? Where do people stand on immigration um, and access to services for all people? Where do people stand on education? So I think that uh, w there's a lot of key races here, particularly around public advocate, which is a, 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 a would be, if they use the office the right way, it would be a very beneficial office for us to have a, 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 a fighter um, for police reform, which we, kind of really didn't really have in the past. But anyway, that's just my personal opinion. So I just think elevating the issues, attending town halls, and then using your vote wisely, whether it's in a primary or in a general election, um, and vote for justice, vote for equality, um, and vote with your gut. Do whatever, however, whatever makes you feel good, do it. Just on the, the polling issue, uh, I don't know what the question was that was put to the public, but every pollster knows that the results can be greatly influenced by what the question is that was asked. So that may have something to do with um, the support for uh, Muslim surveillance. But I think also if you link that question with something like, there's evidence that uh, anti-abortion violence and anti-gay violence is linked to Christian churches. What do you think of placing police informants in churches, and you ask the Muslim surveillance piece in that context, you might get a very different response. On the IG bill, I think at least a good point was brought up in that we should never rely on just one thing. So, uh, you know, CARE New York is, is supporting CPR, and we're, of course, supporting the effort to pass a Community Safety Act. But we have to realize there are many efforts across communities to reform the NYPD. And we've seen it, uh, we've heard it spoken about on this panel, and we just need to realize we all have individual responsibilities. And look at organizations that are organizing around the NYPD. You'll see not all of them are just promoting the IG bill. You'll find many people trying different strategies to make sure elected officials, including law enforcement, no, we are going to hold them accountable when we think that they're doing things inappropriate in our communities. Uh, so I just think that's worthy to highlight there. On the, the poll question, I do think it brings up an, uh, an important point we brought up earlier, talking about how Islamophobia actually is not isolated to uh, what the question may have been isolated to. But if we look at the acceptance of the mass surveillance of Muslim communities in New York, it's closely related to anti-Muslim bigotry in general. And the fact is, when we had elected officials who have promoted anti-Muslim bigotry, when we've had media outlets 
promote anti-Muslim bigotry, and when we've seen organized religion and educational institutes promote anti-Muslim bigotry, people don't tend to think Muslims should have the same rights as people who are not Muslim. And this really even goes back to our question about the connections between Latino, African American communities and Muslim communities. What we've seen is many of these minority communities have been dehumanized in the eyes of everyday citizens. So the same people who are very comfortable denying American Muslims the same civil rights all Americans should have would also be very comfortable denying African Americans or Latinos the same civil rights all Americans should have. So I think it, it at least highlights something of us realizing why these incidents are not isolated. Again, we get very passionate and angry about anti-Muslim subway ads, but we need to be able to see that same passion and anger when these organizations are asking you to call elected officials and hold them accountable for promoting policies that promote anti-Muslim bigotry. Um, and I think it, there is one other part I wanted to mention about the poll. You have the poll and we're talking about dehumanizing these minority communities, but also talking about why elected officials are not responsive to, I guess, the message we're promoting here. And I think what we find is a lot of elected officials only have their own interests in mind. But we really need to be vigilant about correcting those interests. Um, you have many organizations that call out on people to call elected officials, email elected officials. I know ANY recently did an action alert. And it's very easy to get encouraged and energetic about doing certain campaigns that are fun, or whether it's on social media or simply telling friends about something. But when we ask people to call elected officials and, and make sure that they hear your voice, it does have an impact. We've seen it directly. I've contacted elected officials who have told our office before. They are glad that we called them, but they're not sure they have Muslim constituents in their district. We should never give our elected officials the benefit of the doubt of knowing what kind of issues we're concerned about. So I guess, again, just to encourage you guys to follow the organizations that are here, uh, the JAI Coalition, AANY, everyone that was on this panel, and make sure when you see action alerts about contacting elected officials that we take those to heart and really come out in the same force that a lot of these other groups do. Uh, it's only when we, we make sure they hear our voice that we can be comfortable knowing that you know they've heard us. We can hold them accountable. Thank you. Um, you know, I think something along the lines of that is just making it easy on ourselves. I don't know about you, um, but I'm going to admit to having to look up my representative's number every time. And I don't know why I don't just program it into my phone. So I would actually suggest as an action step, when you go home tonight, look up your representatives, program their numbers into your phone. You can call them so easily that way. And then you can develop very intimate relationships with their staff which is so useful. Um, okay, so um, I want to do a very quick last round of questions, and then I'm going to ask um, all of our panelists to say some last words. For, um, both Muslims and, and, and um, so, the, so the anti surveillance and the anti Chris, um, Stop and Chris, um, in city council, no, that's great. So where do we stand in current city council as far as support that we have been able to see maybe in, in votes on the different uh, bills in the Community Safety Act could be useful? Um, yes, okay. Um, I understand. <laughs> this doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't know I have a of questions about the mayoral candidates. Uh, this morning I received something in the mail that the four mayoral candidates, um, uh, Quinn, de Blasio, Thompson, and Lou are going to be speaking. Um, in Harlem in a few days, and I didn't bring it with me, but I'm sure somebody in here knows when that is, and it's in, do, do you know? Pardon me? On Thursday evening on 165th and Broadway, is it? I'm with that. Yeah, well, there's the Shabbat Center? Pardon me? Shabbat Center? Yes, the Shabbat Center. They're going to be speaking. Now, because of that, I looked up uh, where my, those candidates stand on uh, Israel, Palestine. And you're not going to ask you to Well, I, I will, but I just have to. And, and Iran, because I think that these two issues are very related to the whole racism issue. And it was shocking, and it was horrible, and it was racist. Every, every one of them. And what I'm, say, what I'm asking the people in this room to do is to go to the Shabbat Center on Thursday night 
and stand up and start asking, confronting these four candidates on where they stand on everything from stop and frisk to Israel-Palestine to the these horrible lies about Iran about and, and the issues that we've been discussing, the surveillance and everything that we've been discussing. Great. Because so unless they're say. directly confronted... Okay, now I'm going to cut you off. Okay. So Thursday, it sounds like it's a good time, thank you, um, to start um, what, what Linda and other panelists have been saying of letting our representatives know that this is crucially important to us and that we are going to vote and our communities are going to vote uh, based on it. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you guys, and second to my most important sisters, Salam. But I just want to know what's going on in terms of like outreach, like not necessarily Dawa, but is it like do we organize like visit a mosque day or hand out some pamphlets or something like that, like acts of shape or like well, what what can we do to like stop the misconceptions about Islam? I've been told I worship the moon, so <laughs> honestly. Okay, so do some some brief um, answers to those questions. Um, all right, so I guess. Just real quick on that second about uh, what we can do. Um, so there, there it is. We sense this frustration many times with people saying, well, what is it we can do to correct these misconceptions? Um, and one, we do encourage people to be part of larger programs. So one of the problems we talked about is creating this sense of awareness. We as a community need to realize that programs just for ourselves in our mosques about our own issues, you know, although they're great and they are necessary, we need to consider opening up to do programs about other greater issues. Um, and this is a great plug-in for an upcoming CARE event as well. I do want everyone to know that this Thursday night at Columbia Law School in the Jerome Green Hall, room 103, we are having an event. It's a book launch of Trevor Aronson's The Terror Factory. And it's about the, manuf the FBI's manufactured war on terrorism. Um, and this event in itself will hit two things that I think that are crucial to what you mentioned. When we're talking about awareness, we have one, the awareness to help Americans in general realize some of the challenges American Muslims are facing, right? We hear about these great uh, terrorist plots that are foiled, and many Americans tend to feel threatened at the same time by the FBI stories, and safer as well when they hear about the FBI foiling these terrorist plots. But we need to make sure the community realizes, again, when we're talking about Islamophobia not being isolated. And when we talk about Islamophobia feeding itself, that the FBI is in fact creating this perception that Muslims are dangerous. The NYPD is creating the perception that Muslims are dangerous to not just justify their own work, but to also get an applause by it from our community. So the Terror Factory is really a good expose. It really reveals how the FBI has been manufacturing terrorist plots. And it also fuels into this uh, discussion about Islamophobia where it's actually these fake terrorist plots that the FBI has been creating is what actually makes Americans feel a bit more comfortable denying American Muslims of those rights. Uh, the second part, though, is educating the American Muslim community about the exact same issue. I think it was very easy for 10, even 5, maybe even 3 years ago, and to this day by many American Muslims. When we hear about the NYPD or the FBI foil a terrorist plot, we want to congratulate them and thank them for arresting extremists in our community. But we need to realize, and hopefully it's through events like this, that what the NYPD and FBI have been doing, that we've been thanking them in doing, is they've been perpetuating the perception of Muslims being terrorists, not in fact stopping terrorism. And they've been doing that for their own purposes. So again, there's that sense of awareness. But again, if you look at the CARE New York website, I'll do plugins as much as the questions let me, care-ny.org, Sure. We also provide programs for Muslim communities in Masajid, uh, in the mosques, at Islamic centers, whether they're Know Your Rights workshops to teach people about the tactics that the FBI and law enforcement use against American Muslims, letting them know what their rights are, how they can combat these things. Um, also, we have Know Your Rights workshops about many other areas. Know Your Rights in the workplace. Um, know Your Rights when traveling. And again, what we're trying to highlight is the fact that many of these policies that impact American Muslims are policies that facilitate anti-Muslim bigotry in our communities. And it's not when we actually begin to realize what our rights are, stand up for those rights, and stand up for those constitutional rights. That's when we're going to see that we actually align with many other Americans on holding the Constitution sacred, on demanding that our rights are respected, just as all Americans demand their rights are respected, and also combating the elements of bigotry and xenophobia that all Americans want to combat. 
Um, as far as other programs for your mosque, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. I, there are many programs. I've actually been a board member of, of two Islamic centers in the past that I think are good for creating a sense of community. Uh, just very quickly, I think all you guys need to realize, you know, again, as New Yorkers, we should reach out to these institutions as well. Uh, we work in many areas, and one of the areas is responding when a, a hate-motivated crime occurs. And many times, the first thing we ask a Muslim community when they have been the victims of a hate-motivated crime, a hate crime, we tell them, well, what kind of relationships do you have with your neighbors? And unfortunately, many times we have people in the Muslim community that tell us we don't have any relationships with any of our neighbors. So I think it's, it's utmost important for us, not just as an Islamic principle, which it is, but an American principle, to really reach out to our neighbors. Send them letters. Let them know you're in the neighborhood. You know, we, when, we, when we work together, we begin to realize we have many issues we want to work on together. And then our reach gets much further. As less than 1% of the population, we have a lot of networking to do to make sure that we build these coalitions. But it, it can be done, and again, I'd love to talk to you afterwards about that if you'd like. Um, just on the city council question, um, w sometimes when we're doing legislative advocacy, we focus on the ones that didn't sign on to our stuff, but we forget to thank those that um, are our champions um, and continue to create that political uh, opportunity for them to continue to be champions on social justice um, issues. Um, and I just want to say, just from my own personal experience, some of those champions um, are Jumani Williams, who's the introducer of the first three legislations, Intro 700, uh, 799, Intro 800, Intro 801, um, and then uh, Councilmember Brad Lander, you know, a Jewish guy from Park Slope. Um, so I think that uh, if you go to the New York City Council website and you look up intro 799, 800, 801, and 881, you can see the list. It's public. And if your city council member is on it, I'm sorry, sorry, 799, 800, 801, and 881, so those four legislations, look up the list. It's public online at the New York City Council website. And if your city council member is on it, just call them and say thank you. Send them an email. They don't expect it, and it really provides the motivation for them to continue to stand up for uh, the issues that we care about. Um, and others who are not the official introducers of the bills, um, whether it's Council Member uh, da uh, Danny Drum, Melissa Mark Viverito, um, Letitia James, I mean, the entire black progress the black caucus the asian caucus the progressive caucus i mean the bills actually have anywhere between and there might be recent you know developments anywhere between 27 to 33 co-sponsors on the ig bill all we need is one more guy or gal and it's veto proof majority um so anyone who is uh can look up that list if you don't see your city council member on it push them um for it. And just on the last piece, on the da'wah piece, da'wah is basically, uh, you know, outreach, um, you know, and, and, and educating people uh, about Islam. My personal experience has been personal, right? When you, as a, as a young Muslim man, opens a door for a woman, that by itself um, is for me an act of da'wah. A uh, Muslim serving those who were affected by Sandy was for me an act of um, a da'wah, and that's how I was perceiving it at the moment. And changing the perceptions of what uh, people think of us by doing acts of service and acts of generosity, which is exactly what our faith teaches us. So we're not doing anything like special, like that's what we're supposed to do technically. So just thinking about those individual opportunities that you have um, to be a good Muslim, which really means being a good New Yorker and a good neighbor. Um, a couple months ago, we had the opportunity, a group of uh, youth members from the organization had the opportunity to sit down with uh, public advocate Bill de Blasio and speak um, around the issue of stop and frisk. And he kept leaning towards Nick and saying, you know, I quote you all the time. Um, and I think, uh, you know, definitely creating spaces for young people's voices to be part of the conversation is something that I want to bring to the forefront. Um, and, you know, I, I have the privilege of working with young people in the capacity of a, as a creative writing teacher with hip hop and poetry. And I think about the stories that our young people have to tell when we do a workshop around Stop and Frisk. And it's incredible. So it, and to, to hear a, a letter from, from your son, Linda, and uh, to hear Nick's article about why is the NYPD after me and why is there this culture of fear around who I am is so important. One of the classes that I work with in Brooklyn taught me an important lesson that I need to share with you. If the point of poetry is to humanize, then poetry is not the point. 
And I think it has a lot, that has a lot to do with the work that we're doing here. We hear a lot around statistics or numbers around 88% black and Latino. And these are just numbers, but who are the human beings? What are the, who are the faces behind this? And it's as simple as asking a young person, there's many young people here from the organization, um, about their experience and just creating that relationship one-on-one, -on -one, but also creating platforms for their voices to be heard. Well, that was a, a beautiful note from Frank. Um, I think I'm just going to ask if there's anything else that anyone um, on the panel wanted to say as just a final last word before we close. Just really quick, uh, Columbia Law School, Thursday, January 31st, 6.30 p.m., book launch of the Terror Factory, Trevor Aronson's Terror Factory. And then again um, on February 21st at the Malcolm X and Betty Shabazz Center. Again, please just follow Care New York on Facebook. Check us out on our website. You can get uh, up to date on all these events and some of the other activities we're doing in New York. Thank you all. When I first got on to the stage, Mir um, invited me to his organization to go check it out, so I'll leave you with the same. Um, we're located, the Brothers is so located at West 143rd between Broadway and Hamilton. We're the only little brownstone on the block, so please feel free to come by and give us a visit and check us out. We have some uh, pamphlets in the back, um, leaflets rather, about our theory of change and the work that we do. It's totally ineffective. Not a single criminal lead has been produced by 10 years of surveillance of the Muslim community. The claim of, of 14 plots that were interdicted uh, was a total fantasy. It was made up. It's not nothing. It's very, very harmful. Uh, it is harmful to the Muslim community. It is harmful to the sense of civic uh, connection and understanding and tolerance. Thank you. Please keep those human faces um, in your uh, in, in your work when you're meeting with city council member. This is not just about uh, doing the right thing. This is about humans and how the work and the, what we've talked about these policies and how they affect um, young people. If you want to stay connected to our work, um, again, we're also on social media. Um, find us at, at the Muslim American Civil Liberties Coalition, which is on Facebook, and we uh, particularly focus on the NYPD surveillance and stop and frisk. Um, and also, um, I'm on Twitter. I well, you, if you want to get into my mind every day um, and the issues I'm working on, um, El Sarsour, so it's just my first initial and last name. Um, and again, uh, look forward to uh, reforming our New York Police Department and making it one that works for all of us and for all New Yorkers. Well, thank you so much. I'll do just uh, one plug as well. The Jews Against Islamophobia Coalition. Um, you can visit our, our website and also um, on Twitter and Facebook and um, Jews for Racial and Economic Justice and um, Jewish Voice for Peace. Also, Facebook and Twitter pages that you can follow and sign up for our email list to get notices about events like this. Um, and I think um, I want to just thank everyone, thank all of you for coming here tonight, thank our speakers here. Um, I think something that we talked about was that um, these programs really rob us of our humanity. Um, the hate speech, these programs by the NYPD, um, government policies are really robbing all of us of our humanity. And I feel like um, the work that we're doing together and the relationships we're building here are about demanding our humanity back. So thank you and have a wonderful night.